Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Highland Branch virtual event, which will look at the recent resurfacing and expansion of RAF Lossiemouth airfield while flying operations continued and despite the pandemic and national lockdown. My name is Nick Mudford and on behalf of the Highland Branch Committee, I'm pleased to welcome society members, friends of the branch and also those joining us for the first time. I'm really interested to know where people are joining us from tonight, so please use the Q&A tab to say hello and tell us where you're from. Now, before we start, um, as chairman of the branch, I'd like to pay tri tribute to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke of Edinburgh had a long and close association with the Royal and Aer Aeronautical Society and was a strong advocate of the engineering profession. An honorary, er an honorary fellow of the society since 1954 and the honorary president in 1966, he spoke frequently on the importance of engineering and on the need to encourage young people into careers in aviation and aerospace engineering. He also had a long-standing connection with Murray, including his honorary Air Commodore of Royal Air Force Station Kinloss until it closed in 2011. It is fitting that the Nimrod overlooking Fintorn Bay bears his title. Turning to tonight's event, um, Keith Maplethorpe and his team are going to tell us about how they managed to achieve a massive infrastructure project um, despite all of the obstructions and keeping flying operations going at a very, very busy flying station. Please post your questions in the Q&A tab throughout the talk and vote in support of questions which others have already posted. I'll then put your questions to Keith in the Q&A session at the end. Keith Maplethorpe has been a director at Volker Fitzpatrick for over 15 years, working in sectors as diverse as offshore wind, waste recycling and land remediation. More recently, he has focused on winning and delivering military projects and has worked on projects in Ascension Island and the Falkland Islands. Based in Stirling, he joined the project team at Lossy Mouth in, in March 2020 to provide focused local project delivery once COVID travel restrictions were established. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you tonight's key speaker, Keith Maplethorpe. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our recent airfield project at RAF Lossy Mouth. The format this evening will be a PowerPoint presentation of the project, incorporating three short films followed by a question and answer session. After a quick introduction, I will give an overview of the project, the key design issues and the challenges that we faced. We then had to deal with a fresh set of challenges with the onset of COVID. I will outline how we dealt with them. We will then show a short film highlighting how we used our new technologies to improve our project delivery. The critical phase of the project was the bolt hole, where the airfield was close to aircraft, allowing us to accelerate our works. And we will run through our approach to risk management during this period. We cannot show you how we did it using PowerPoint, so we have two more short films to finish our presentation, at which point we will move on to the Q&A session. So to introduce the Volker Fitzpatrick team, I'm Keith Maplethorpe and I was the project director with overall responsibility for the project. And I'm joined this evening by Dan Reynolds, our design manager, and Andy Reynolds, our operations manager. Dan and I were responsible for the development and planning of the works. Andy was responsible for the delivery. Volker Fitzpatrick are one of the five Volker Group companies who make up Volker Vessels UK. We are one of the leading UK construction businesses with a particular focus on airports, marine, rail, and road infrastructure. This project forms one part of the Lossiemouth development program, upgrading the basin facilities in readiness for the arrival of the new fleet of P8 Poseidon aircraft. Our contract was to upgrade the airfield operating services. This can be broken down into four areas. The main runway, the secondary runway, the P8 ASP, and the northern taxiway. The four concrete thresholds at the ends of each runway were to be broken out and completely rebuilt, and a new asphalt wearing course applied to the full length of both runways. The northern taxiway was to be widened to accommodate the larger aircraft and a completely new service platform constructed. 
This was the size of 30 football pitches and is the largest single ASP construction project undertaken by the RAF. With the project being a design and build contract, Volk Fitzpatrick, along with our design consultants, had to develop the outline plans provided by the client. We had to ensure airfield non-conformances were rectified and compliance was provided upon project completion. Design and compliance were determined and governed by the Military Aviation Authority through their regulatory article document series and ultimately ICAO regulations. Volk Fitzpatrick were appointed principal designer for the works and the design team assisted in this role, providing technical support throughout the construction phase of the project. Upon handover, along with construction record drawings to aid future maintenance works, we provided a digital 3D model, which will be covered later. I will highlight a couple of areas reviewed and improved by Volker Fitzpatrick and our designer during the design stage, which provided optimization for use during construction and for the end user and operator. The original 05 concrete end was constructed in 1972. The original turning loop was identified through a maintenance inspection report in 2015 that it was no longer suitable for fast jets. As part of the design, it was planned to incorporate the turning loop into the main runway surface. The requirement for the turning loop is due to the only Code E taxiway being located at the opposite end of the main runway, with all Code E aircraft having to backtrack up the runway to exit. The preliminary layout allowed for a Typhoon, a Voyager and the pursuing Boeing Poseidon aircraft either to exit or turn in this location. Through the design process, the C-17 Globemaster also needed to be considered. The original size at tender was excessively large and we were able to reduce this to produce something more maintainable and cost effective. Another key factor in our design was regulating the pavement levels through this section of the airfield. The image on the right hand side of the slide shows the contours are regular and constant in our constructed solution, which makes the turning of the aircraft more manageable and predictable. The redesign of a runway pavement is difficult. There are considerations to both the crossfall to help the rain move more effectively to the edges to provide a dry surface, but also you have to keep it as flat as possible to provide a stable landing for aircraft. And obviously these two factors contradict each other. It's only made more difficult and complicated by having two runways that cross and intersect like RAF lossy mouth, particularly when the existing runways didn't drain very effectively. Ensuring the intersection gradients remain compliant for both runways was crucial, as any changes to this area would impact both runways in all four directions coming away from it. The sections at the bottom of the screen are taken through the main runway, running left to right. These demonstrate how the runway profile changes in 400 metres through the intersection. We start at changes 1200, where you have this traditional crown down the centre of the runway, pushing the water to the edges. As you get into the centre of the intersection, changes 1350, you go to a single fall, so all the water moves to one side only. And then at 1600, we return back to this crown detail where water is pushed to both edges. Getting this change through the intersection is difficult in construction, but also in design. The original aircraft service platform, or Chai Delta as it was designated, was to be fully demolished to allow for a more usable ASB to be constructed. The general arrangement can be seen on the slides. The new ASB had to allow for the parking of unarmed aircraft, which is the five grouped together on the left hand side, parking for armed aircraft, the three spaced out bottom right, two additional spaces for visiting aircraft top left, and also a space for a post flight rinse facility, which is labelled top right hand side. The taxiway which runs along the southern or bottom edge of the apron was to be large enough to accommodate Code D aircraft, as the Poseidon aircraft was predominantly using this space for parking maintenance and inspections. The post-fight rinse facility was particularly interesting in how it interfaced with the rest of the apron, having its own design restrictions. The purpose of the facility was to wash aircraft post-flight, to remove salt and other things which it may have collected during flight to protect them and reduce maintenance issues. Similar to runways, large areas like aprons need to be effectively drained to remove rainwater from the surface. This again ensures aircraft can manoeuvre effectively during all conditions. Large concrete surfaces can collect a lot of water during storms which need to be displaced quickly. This is done by different features like narrow slot openings in the pavement 
or by porous asphalt on the southern edge, letting water soak through it. Once the water is away from the surface, it needs to be discharged into the burn locally, which ultimately runs to the coast. Whilst this is ideal for keeping the pavement puddle free, other issues need to be considered to ensure pollution is kept to an absolute minimum and there is no risk to local water quality or wildlife. Like other airfields, RF Lost in Alpha has fuel tankers, which means we need to design for drips, leaks or full-blown spills. In addition to fuel, there is de-icer, which is obviously applied to aircraft, salts, oils and with other chemicals which could be found there. To protect the environment, we installed several large underground tanks, to capture the chemicals with filters in and these ensured that they, the chemicals didn't make it into the local streams or rivers. Should a large incident occur, these tanks were also fitted with a local alarm to tell people they need to be empty because they detected oil silts and needed cleaning and emptying. Also, the aircraft wash system looked to store its own water in its own underground tank where it was clean and recycled. This kept the overall mains water use down but also meant it could be used if mains water wasn't available. Division of lighting design proposed the use of 14 high mass lights, one of which was located within the apron itself. Having one within the apron caused an obstruction to aircraft and would have made maintenance to the column and light fittings more difficult in regards to gaining access to a live apron with the vehicles and tools needed. Through the design process and speaking to our supply chain, we are able to reduce the number of masks from 14 to 8 while still providing the same light coverage to all 10 aircraft parking slots. This includes removing the one from within the apron as this was key to delivering the safest option. They are also located outside of the taxiway strip to the rear of the apron, again making the solution safer. The lights were upgraded to LEDs from the original halogen lights, this provided better maintenance assurance and also reduced overall energy consumption for which is important even to RAF stations. Being sustainable with our design and construction will aid the theme to follow through the life cycle of the asset. The scope of the project was to upgrade and replace all the ground lights within our works area. This included both runways, the northern taxiway and the new apron. In addition, we installed a completely new print and duct network to allow for the new fittings to be recabled and maintained more easily in the future. These again were upgraded from old halogen fittings to new LED lights. The change to LED units again reduced overall energy consumption of the system and provided a longer service life than the old fittings with a smaller chance of faults, similar to the high mass lights mentioned earlier. The PAPIs were also replaced with the new units being reset for the new Poseidon aircraft to aid with landing. The construction of these is key to ensure the aircraft can land safely and have such a small margin of error. They have to take into account the slope of the runway, the slope of the adjacent ground, but also the glide path angle to ensure the aircraft can all land safely. Also as part of the project, we changed all of the signage across the airfields and this signage is updated and upgraded again to LED but also the naming convention was changed to make it more standard to aid visiting aircraft pilots navigate their way around and also to assist ground moving vehicles and the resident pilots. To deliver our project we faced a number of challenges. Our works had to be undertaken on a live airfield and we could not undertake any works that would disrupt the 24-7 QRA Typhoon operations, except during the bolt hole period. Our design phase had to comply with BIM Level 2, which meant a very detailed digital model of the whole airfield was required before and after works completion. The bolt hole period was the key phase of the project where we would be given unrestricted access to all operating services while QRA operations were established elsewhere. This required us to greatly increase our workforce for a short period of 24-7 working. The project would be undertaken in three phases. Phase one would allow us to undertake works on the main runway and thresholds, the northern taxiway and the service platform. QRA would operate from the secondary runway. We effectively had two work areas with considerable distance to travel between each area. 
This required us to establish separate welfare and storage areas. Phase two was the bolt hole period. This was to be a four week period where the 10 ends, the runway intersection and the QRA taxiway were to be completed, including all lighting, drainage and comms. This was our only opportunity to work in this area. Everything had to be completed and commissioned within the bolt hole to allow QRA operations to return. Failure to complete all works within the bolt hole period would have a very serious impact on QRA operations. Phase three was for us to complete and commission the secondary runway with the main runway and ASP area now in operation. At the end of phase three, our works are now complete. One of the biggest challenges for airfield works is logistics and security. An efficient security clearance process prevents delays to the commencement of work activities. The flow of traffic around the site also needs detailed planning. Batching plants need to be erected in a location which allows large volumes of raw material to be imported every day and concrete and asphalt to be distributed quickly around the site. Haul routes need to ensure that all working areas can be reached while maintaining separation from airfield operations and FOD discipline. We knew communication would be a major challenge. Essentially, the project consisted of Fog Fitzpatrick as main contractor, DIO as our client, and Station as the end user. However, this map of all the stakeholders highlights the challenge we faced. Regular interface meetings were set up between many of these groups throughout the duration of the project. And then COVID, and we were faced with a new set of challenges which we had no roadmap for in the middle of a complex, fast moving project. We had to take on new biosecurity issues, deal with the national lockdown, and review how we would achieve the acceleration required for bolt hole. With very few exceptions, Falk Fitzpatrick continued construction works throughout the COVID crisis. As a company and as individual projects, we had to rapidly assess and act upon the implications of constantly emerging government guidelines, both for the UK and for Scotland. We brought in additional temporary accommodation to double the size of our office and welfare areas. Our commercial and design teams both started working from home. We held frequent toolbox talks with the workforce, stressing the importance of social distancing, personal hygiene, and spotting the symptoms of COVID. All of our work activities were risk assessed to ensure that we could maintain a minimum of two meters distance at all time. However, a key plank of our COVID response was the setting up of a dedicated on-site COVID testing facility. By late April, we became aware of commercially available lateral flow antibody testing kits. By the 5th of May, we had established the process of testing all of our workforce and visitors on a weekly basis, with 20% of the workforce tested every day. This gave me real-time information of any COVID indicator on site and allowed us to act accordingly. We designated a spare house as COVID house. This allowed us to isolate, but also support any member of a workforce who tested positive. This approach was designed to prevent single COVID cases leading to larger outbreaks. However, this generated its own challenge. In June, we had two suspicious test results. We immediately debriefed the individuals to see who their close contacts had been. We isolated them in COVID house and arranged for COVID tests at the NHS testing facility in Inverness. We stopped work for the day. We retested the whole site and carried out a deep clean of the working area of the two individuals. Everyone was sent home to allow us to focus on dealing with the incident. This was an ultra precautionary approach, reflecting our responsibility to our workforce, but also to the base and the wider community. However, news filtered out onto social media, 
and within hours we had become known as the Lossy Mouth Cluster. Once the facts of the incident were understood, and despite being widely praised for our COVID procedures by Public Health Scotland and the local community, we became a focal point for the differences in policy of the UK and Scottish Government. Over the next 48 hours, I was providing updates to the Defence Minister, the Head of Public Health Scotland, and the local MP and MSP for the area, as well as for the BBC. As well as the huge challenge of navigating the health and safety issues related to COVID, we also had to contend with the lockdown of the construction industry in Scotland. Our project was given the status of essential infrastructure and our workforce classified as key workers. But factories in the UK, USA and Europe closed down and the manufacture of key materials and equipment needed for bolt hole were delayed by months. Even local suppliers such as concrete suppliers and builders merchants shut down. As all the local hotels were also closed, we were unable to book accommodation to allow us to increase our workforce for bolt hole. Flights to Inverness were suspended, and as both company and government guidance was for the avoidance of public transport, we now had a situation where the only option for some of our workforce was a 16-hour car journey to get home. We were working, but we had become very isolated. So they were our project challenges. To give you some PowerPoint relief, we will now show you our first short film. This film demonstrates how we incorporate the use of new technology to improve our delivery of the project. The DIO awarded a £75 million contract to upgrade Lossiemouth Airfield to Volker Fitzpatrick in August 2019. The project is best described as complex and programme critical. The complexity came from having to rebuild two runways and taxiways and to construct the RAF's large Stever apron for its new fleet of reconnaissance aircraft, whilst at all times maintaining 24-7 airfield operations at the RAF's primary base for defending UK airspace. Digital technology enabled us to successfully deliver the project. There are three areas we will share with you. Um, the job itself was split over four phases and there were nine work areas. And within those phases, we would be working on three to four work areas concurrently. But in phase two, the bull tool, which was the most complex part of the project, we were working in all nine areas. We had great difficulty communicating the program to the client, to the site management team and to the workforce. I produced weekly time slice visual graphics using PowerPoint to try and communicate where we were working and when, and this transformed everybody's understanding of the project. Had we been able to use some of the technology currently available to the business, such as Genie Belt, Hollow Builder, and the Nevisworks 4D simulation, we would have massively improved communication between the site team and the operatives, and also between the site team and the client. The project was BIM Level 2 compliant, and that was stipulated by the client at tender. To be BIM Level 2 compliant, this requires the use of a common data environment, CDE, for which we use a platform called A-Site. The A-Site platform also managed the flow of information efficiently from the design team, through site management, to the engineers on the ground. Engineers are able to download the A-Site app to their tablets, which allowed them access to up-to-date drawings in the field, but they could also raise TQs and RFIs without coming back to the office. Because of the use of these systems, there's very little rework or time loss through incorrect or unbuildable designs. A large portion of the project was new concrete pavement, which released a lot of follow-on work to other trades. Getting this done as efficiently as possible was key to the successful delivery of the project. Concrete has a temperature maturity relationship, and using sensors embedded within the concrete to provide constant temperature information and an external software to process this, we were able to accurately monitor concrete strength gain. We reduced standard curing times from three days to 24 hours during the summer months, as the target strengths had been achieved a lot quicker than expected. Overall, using the system, we have estimated eight days were saved on the programme. At RAF Lossiemouth, the key to the success of the programme rested with the concrete paving works, which saw us batch in excess of 90,000 cubes of concrete over the course of the project, 20,000 cubes of which was laid in the month of August alone. To monitor live progress, Volker Fitzpatrick developed a mobile and desktop application specifically for paving works, which gave me instant visibility of what was being batched, any delays on site, 
and running totals over the course of the day for each of my slip form paving teams. This data was automatically retrieved by sensors in the plant and batching facilities as well as directly from the app by operatives on the ground to provide real-time updates of concrete movements. Access to this data helps steer crucial decisions on programme, for much of which the concrete paving work sat on the critical path. For example, if our outputs had fallen, I was updated through the app in real time, allowing me to quickly make operational decisions to minimise the impact and get back on track. It also allowed me to boost morale by introducing an element of competition with my teams, where the app allowed me to identify who had laid the most concrete over the course of the recent days, weeks and months, and set targets for them. Having this instant visibility at my fingertips was essential in keeping the end goal in sight and ultimately delivering the success of our largest paving project to date. We are now at the crucial phase of the project. During this period, QRA will be relocated. There are a number of activities that can only be undertaken in the short window, and we will have unrestricted access to all operating services. There will be a major acceleration of effort with day and night shift operations and very high outputs to be achieved. This was due to start in mid-June. However, it quickly became clear that this was no longer achievable. COVID meant that key materials were up to three months behind schedule. We were unable to increase our workforce due to lack of accommodation and social distancing requirements. By the end of April, we were at best 10 weeks behind schedule, with many risks still remaining. This prompted a comprehensive project review. Working very closely with the IO, QRA and base operations, we developed an alternative strategy. We re-established the key project drivers for the clients rather than the original contract drivers. The key priority was the delivery of the P8s before first frost. We took this as mid-October, just two weeks later than our current contract requirements, but achievable. We agreed that the certainty of delivery of the bolt hole works was more important than duration or start date. We couldn't organise a second bolt hole, so we designed a new one. It was to start on the 17th of August, nine weeks later than planned, but would last for eight weeks rather than four weeks. This was to recognise it would only now be possible to run a single day shift, albeit the day shift would still be a much larger workforce. Crucially though, the last day of bolt hole now coincided with the completion and commissioning of the main runway, the ASP and the Northern Taxiway. This made a huge volume of work critical during the bolt hole period. We had gained eight and a half weeks on the expected program completion date but created a huge cliff edge. Every day was critical, there could be no slippage. We now entered a period of intense risk management. Everything that could possibly impact on successful delivery during bolt hole was reviewed. We identified four key risks that carried the biggest threat. First, an uncoordinated approach between our work teams but also between ourselves, base operations and other DIO projects. Second, the ongoing COVID situation and the threat of further restrictions or an outbreak within our workforce. Third, and more mundane, buried services. And fourth, the curse of all construction projects, the Scottish weather. Weekly Bartol coordination meetings were held with all relevant stakeholders. These were well attended decision making forums. Any issue that couldn't be agreed on was referred to a second forum to develop solutions and report back. A good example of this is the underground services where a second weekly forum dealt with all BT comms issues. There were three clear phases of risk management. Firstly, Bartol preparation ensuring we got to the start line in good shape. Secondly, bolt hole delivery, ensuring we were running a good race. And thirdly, handover and commissioning, ensuring speedy and effective handover to base operations at the end of bolt hole. As Richard alluded to in our use of technology film, this was a complex fast track project 
The traditional bar chart program for the project was far too inaccessible for the majority of the team, and I felt only understood by the planner himself. We developed an alternative graphical program that ensured every area of the work had an effective, clearly understood plan. I discussed earlier how we developed COVID testing as a risk mitigation strategy. We continued the testing through to the end of the project and eventually carried out over five and a half thousand tests. Overall, we had 83 positive tests covering 10 individuals. It was an extremely effective way for us to monitor and manage COVID safety on site. And a year later is now being copied in schools and other settings across the country. It was also extremely popular across the workforce. We always felt it could only ever be a voluntary process, but compliance was always close to 100%. As well as providing the weekly all clear to our workforce, it was a source of much comfort for the wider families as it gave them a really good indicator that they did not have COVID in their family bubble. Airfields are complex sites with a vast array of varied services. When you have an old airfield, such as RAF Lossiemouth, this complexity is considerably increased. Old redundant services get forgotten about but remain underground. High security direct comms cables are not shown on any service plans and are impossible to trace. Unknown electrics and water are frustrating, but they are usually quick to deal with for the site team. However, comms and especially fibre optics are the big challenge. Even known services with time to plan a diversion can take many months to be resolved. Discoveries of unknown cables have the potential to severely delay the bolt hole. We took a Rumsfeldian approach to underground services. We confirmed and made plans for all of the known knowns. We planned early intrusive investigations to look into the unknown knowns. We carried out numerous walkovers and site surveys looking for the known unknowns. And we developed a resilient strategy to deal with the unknown unknowns by having full-time appointed person on site to help coordinate our response to any unexpected discovery. Weather can be the rock upon which all the best laid plans crash for construction projects. Ours is an outdoor industry and the weather can have a huge say in the outcome of a project. The eight weeks of the bolt hole coincided with the three wettest months of the year for Lossiemouth. We developed strategies to mitigate the worst effects of the weather to any weather susceptible activity and made time risk allowances within our program. However, this remained our biggest uncontrollable risk going into bolt hole. They were the challenges, so how do we do? Well, last day of bolt hole was 11th of October with the first typhoon set to arrive on the morning of the 12th. At 1700 on the 11th of October, DIO accepted handover of the main runway and Charlie Delta ASP. Despite all of the difficulties and the enormous black swan event of COVID, our first key date was delivered only 11 days behind the original program and well before the first frost. The first P8 arrived on the 13th of October. The next film shows the works involved during bolt hole. The film shows an eight week period of the project and has only captured four of our nine work areas, but it gives a really good indication of the scale and intensity of our project works.
So how did we do it? Well, this is where the real star of the show, our operations manager, Andy Reynolds, steps in. Even with the restrictions COVID brought upon us, we were still able to increase our workforce to a peak of 350 people. As travel from this remote part of the UK was so difficult, after consultation with the workforce, we decided to get our heads down and work through, taking just one weekend off over the two month bolt hole period. And every other day, working at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week. This was an amazing effort from everyone involved that frequently pushed us all to our limits. Some ballpark quantities, we broke out over 140,000 tonnes of the existing runway, all of which was crushed, regraded and reused in the works, or ended up in the hands of local farmers to top up their excess tracks. We batched and laid 200,000 tonnes of concrete and over 200,000 square metres of asphalt surfacing. And we managed all of this with no accidents and no lost time injuries. And after the arrival of the P8s, we still had to complete phase three. Here we achieved handover and project completion on the 5th of December, over three months ahead of program and over 10% under budget. It would have been a remarkable achievement even without COVID. Having delivered this project through the worst of the pandemic, it is a real testament to what can be achieved through real collaboration and sheer hard work. And our final film is a really good way to end. It shows the last few months of the project, the construction of the 28M threshold for the secondary runway. The P8s are arrived and can be seen parked up in the background. The weather is closing in, but work continues with the same sense of purpose. The appearance of the rainbow in the closing shot feels entirely appropriate. Thank you. Keith, thank you very much for that run through. Um, there's quite a staggering volume of work that went into it. And I think speaking from a society that spends more time thinking about the, the delicate bits of aluminium and carbon fibre that waft on and off the runway, um, we take for granted the, the sheer volume of stuff and how, how technical the bit that the aircraft bounce off at the beginning and end of the flights actually, actually is. Um, if I could just do a quick comms check before I ask you the first question. Um, can, you, can you just basically say hello and we will see how it's going? Brilliant. Yeah, right. still here. Happy days. Um, in which case, the first question I've got for you is, um, I remember in the prep stages, VFP um, had some really big ambitions about leaving a legacy in the local area and making it more than just a construction within the wire, leaving a benefit for the local community. Um, how much of that ambition were you able to achieve? Quite a lot, actually. Um, I, I think you know Dave Allen um, on base quite well, and he, um, we, uh, our operations director, met Dave, and they devised a plan to um, build a local 4G football pitch at Elgin City. Um, between them, they um, strong armed me to um, ensure that Volker Fitzpatrick uh, were happy to uh, underwrite that as well. But one thing with contractors nowadays is um, social value is, is very important and engagement with the local community. And um, it, it's something that's very encouraged within Volker Fitzpatrick. 
So we're, we're very happy to have been involved in the 4G football pitch then at Elgin. You talked earlier about um, the, the redesigning, redesign the turning circle at the end at the end of the main, main runway to accommodate a range of aircraft. Can you just talk about what was the, what were the most demanding aircraft and what for, that had to be accommodated? One for you, Andy. Say again. I'm going to pass you over to our uh, operations director, uh, Andy Reynolds. Hi there. Um, all aircraft really, I mean, the P-8 was obviously the primary aircraft, but obviously the Voyager was always going to have to be accommodated for. So the turn-in, the turn-in circle was designed, or the turn head was designed for all aircraft, but obviously to try and make the turn as easy as possible for the Voyager. Which has been to lossy mouth, I believe, several occasions since we've finished, though obviously a success with that. Yeah, absolutely. I've watched the Vo I've watched the Voyager come and go for to distance um, on a on a good number of occasions. Um yeah, so that's that's a definite improvement. Um how much quicker then would the runway have been completed if COVID hadn't intervened? I I think I th as we said, we were probably about 10 weeks behind at one point. And um, th that was mainly from materials just being late delivered. And I think if we had those materials on time, I think we would still made up the time we did in bolt hole. Um, so I, I, th I think we would probably have been at least a couple months earlier than we did, which would have been about five months early on a, on a year and a half programme, which would have been phenomenal. Any, any thoughts on that? Andy? This is a shame, really, <clears throat> that the video didn't play through because um, it gives you a true sort of indication on how quick we was building things. The bolt hole uh, with his extension gave us the ability to build what we needed to build, but it also gives us an opportunity to finish the second runway by and large in the same period of time. So by actually delaying because of what was fought to us, it actually gave us an opportunity with people prepared to stay and, and do the work without travel. It gave us a full time um, employees that will stay, get the work done in the time that we had allocated, but also shortened the duration of the whole project because of the commitment. So, yeah, it worked out well. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one, actually, isn't it? Because um, because of COVID, because there was nothing else to do and we couldn't go home. We, we, we just all got on with it. I think we'd have had a lot more pressure for time off and people wanted to get home for holidays and breaks. But because of COVID, there was no breaks and we we were happier working. While we were working, it didn't feel like we were in lockdown. Um, so in some ways, uh, COVID, COVID helped us just to focus on the project and push it along. It's, in, it's interesting to see it actually is not, not not the the lockdown being not not an unmitigated disaster mm. um or at least bring in bring in some i suppose unexpected opportunities thinking again on the programmatics um how much what was the impact of having to work around keeping the keeping the airfield operational and not being able to just work on a on a closed closed airfield for fastest overall com completion 90% of our projects that we do are on live civil airfields. So live operational would mean we get probably six hours at night to complete our works and then have a live airfield in the morning, or we'll be working on taxiways where we've got live aircraft moving around us all the time. So actually working um, on the live side of the airfield was pretty normal. But having the airfield completely to ourselves was just a complete joy, to be fair. I think the difference is uh, when you work in red operations, you're kind of in second or third gear. But as soon as you got the aircraft, the airfield to yourself, you're in fifth gear and you're flying. That, that's what it really feels like. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's interesting to find out actually that the, the, the Air Force isn't the most demanding customer you work with. Um, that's a little bit of a surprise, and I'll say no more on that. Um, one of our audience members has asked how the new improved resurfaced runway compares to other military runways. Pretty much the same, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, 
it was a master asphalt groove surface. Um, the constituents for the aggregates that we get in the northern part of Scotland are very, very high um, in both, you know, the wearing and, and their longevity that we use. Um, it's a very hard aggregate, so therefore, when we groove the runway, it gives a very, very sharp groove, which improves drainage. So the feedback we back from pilots, uh, Typhoon especially, have said that, you know, it's fantastic. The braking action is far much better, which is exactly what we wanted to leave. You've got a main runway and a secondary that done all in the same material. Um, the grooving is performing well and, and the surface is performing well. So, yeah, many years of, of very much the same. It gives a very high level of friction. It gets better as time goes on. So I think, you'll, yeah, everybody will reap the benefits of that. And, yeah, we're really pleased with the, uh, the final version. Thank you, Andy. Um, I think even people might hear in the background some giveaways about how close we all are to the airbase, actually. <laughs> There's night flying going on. Um, yeah. The sound of jet noise is a great thing. Um, again, from the audience, uh, someone is wondering how much of the material was sourced within and also out with the UK. And I think that takes me back to there was a lot of work I know you did on the, on the recycling and reuse. All, all of the bulk aggregates were sourced locally. Um, the cement was coming up from close to Dundee. Yes. The the aggregates were, where was the lease quarry? About 15, 20 miles away? Um, Rothers was yeah. where it was coming from for the surfacing and the lease for the concrete was coming up from Aberdeen. When, when it came to some specialist material, the, the light fittings, a lot of those were manufactured in Belgium, which was a challenge for us. Um, bringing onto site. One, the factory closed, but also there was um, problems getting it through the channel tunnel. Um, the post-flight rinse came from the USA. I think it was Michigan. And um, obviously they suffered very heavily with the lockdown as well, and the factory closed there. Um, I, th I think that's it really. Yeah, the pits, here. the electrical pits, obviously they're reinforced as units that are brought in as one. We had a supplier in Lancashire that couldn't or was working with a restricted workforce due to COVID, which couldn't deliver the full amount that we needed. So we ended up going to a factory of theirs in Ireland and we were bringing them across mm. from Ireland. So that was about it. Everything else was sorted in the UK. Everything came up. Um, you see, the drain is that Dan touched, touched on. We've got the largest interceptor tanks that's ever been moved by uh, UK roads. They come up from the south of England. So yeah, everything was sourced. And I think with COVID and non-travel restrictions actually helped us move that the, yeah. large, the larger tanks yeah. in the country without any real disruption. I think the, the A1 at Newcastle was blocked for four hours and that was about it really. So yeah, we did well, I think. Yeah, it was well. an interesting day. We had the, the huge interceptors going into the site just as Boris Johnson was driving out. So that that, that was quite a good day, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just bring up a point that Dave Higgins working behind the scenes is, is on um, a comment about the lectures, I'm sorry, about the videos. Just request, Dave, could we try and have one of the videos to run at the end of the Q&A, just so if people want to hang around and watch that, they've got the option. It just seemed a shame to have, have all the high quality footage, all the effort we went to to get it to a machine, and then just not to actually get it out and shown. Um, yeah. I wish you good luck with that, because it didn't work perfectly last time. <laughs> um, back to the Q&A. Um, how important was returning the environment, such as the huge grassed areas um, that were disturbed, back to the original state? It's always very important. Um, we took large sections of the base and we used them for material processing yards. Uh, we had two compounds. We had a secondary material processing yard for the 28 end, which we used the uh, Pony Riding Club. So, I mean, to return all these areas back with no issues whatsoever to the people that actually had the, you know, had the kindness said, yeah, we're OK, we'll let you do this. And obviously we do go a long way, you know, we have to surround the ground, we, we make sure there's no leeches or anything that goes into it. So, yeah, for us to return it looking natural, and that's why we're back now, we're back in the, uh, in the spring 
to do a lot of grass seeding and things that we couldn't do in the winter because we finished so early it wasn't worth us trying to do that because we knew it wouldn't grow so we're back to return it so it looks natural and it's you know it's obviously it's important to us that when we finish a project it looks like it's meant to be there thanks andy um are there things which you learned from this project or you had to put in place that actually you're going to be able to take forward to other projects maybe you wouldn't have come across without some of the restrictions definitely we'll never work nearer to norway than home again <laughs> <laughs> especially during a pandemic um yes i mean it's it's always a pleasure when you deliver a project that makes such a difference um I remember coming up in the early days for the briefings and it was all very, very much about national security. And, you know, you've got to understand that, we're, you know, we're construction workers. We're not we're not part of any, you know, major sort of military operation or anything like that. We're construction workers. And, and we felt that the pride of QRA, making sure that there was no hiccups, we know how it would be covered in the papers and nationally it would be construed if we, we didn't get that right. So I think, to be honest, we used 40% of local labour. It was vetted before we used it. We wanted to do that. We didn't want to be bringing people backwards and forwards. That's before COVID. So we did a lot of work. We worked with a local contractor from Forrest when we did Kinloss in 2000. We, we re-employed him again this time, which proved um, very, very successful. He brought a lot of local labour, a lot of local knowledge, and, and it just worked well. So, yeah, we, you know, we'll take this local, working with locals, obviously the collaboration um, between all parties involved were very, very important. We thought the uh, LTT, the transition team, and the development programme team is the first time we've ever worked with anything like that with the military, with the MOD. And um, that was definitely the success or the key to the success of the whole project because it just made everything flow. We had a lot. I think when people read about the amount of aggregates that were coming in every day, there was over 2000 vehicle movements. We had to address the base. We've got a lot of people you know, working on the base while it was all going on, cyclists and obviously cars. You know, we don't want lorries flying past them and tractors and trailers and things. So the logistics side of it was all planned through the traffic management, through LDP, through LTT and work really, really well. And I just think that's what we'll take going forward. You know, that collaboration of such a, a project of this size with an organisation that's, you know, got their own work to do while we're working with inside their environment. That, that's what was the key to the success of it all, was really. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, we've got a couple, we've, we've time for a couple more questions. I've got a few stacked up. If anybody listening wants to get a couple more in just while there's still time, please do. Um, does the runway have any special or unique materials to help it cope with the F-35 um, or any other very unique military requirements like that? No, no, you, you have to um, specify the aircraft that you designed it for and it was designed for the P-8 and it was designed for the Tornado. Yeah, I mean the asphalt surface or the surface course is a Marshall grooved asphalt which is the premium um, surface used in both military and civil airfields. It will cope with anything from a Boeing, you know, A380 fully laden to a Typhoon. The braking action is far superior than the friction courses or any sort of BBA materials that you can use because obviously the friction gets higher as it gets older. So it was a premium um, surface course. There were alternatives at tender stage that was offered or asked for. Uh, but yeah, we were really pleased that they went with the Rolls Royce of, um, of our surface courses really. And I think it will bode well. I mean, any aircraft can land on it and we've had no no reports of anybody having any issues. So yeah, we're happy with it. But it, but it is important to remember, um, so we did tender for the works down at Marham, which was a runway designed for the F-35s. And um, so we've designed you a runway and given you a runway where your tornadoes will take off and your P-8s will take off for the next 20 years, no problem at all. 
you can ruin it with F-35s doing vertical takeoffs on it. It's not a magic runway. And, uh, and, and that's your responsibility. You have to use it as it's meant to be used as well. If we've got lofty ops on there, they can consider themselves duly warned. Only yeah. nice civilized horizontal takeoff, none this, none yeah. this newfangled, vert, none this vertical stuff. Right. right, final question then, unless somebody wants to get someone something in under bar at the very last minute, was if you're doing this project again, that's if you were lucky enough to win and win another um, Air Force res uh, runway resurfacing project, what would you take forward from that and what would you, from this, and what would you do differently? So from my point of view, I think um, the biggest challenge really was we've moved to a different um, stage of design. Now, we, we're, Dan mentioned about that in the, um, in the design and the technology, uh, BIM level two, building information uh, modeling, um, where we have to, everything is 3D, 4D design, um, whereas in the past it would have been 2D design. And a runway, you don't need much more in a cross section and you just repeat that cross section along the whole length. But now we're in the stage of BIM, everything is very, very detailed model. And the, the key to that is really good, accurate surveys before you even think about your design work. And then you let your design team have much, much longer because the whole thing with BIM is it's error-free design. Um, if you give them long enough, they will stitch everything together. Once they finished design work, then you start building. And what we did, we were more used to the traditional way where you give your designer a couple months, get ahead of the game, and then you just keep chasing them for the rest of the project to give you that information. And what we found here is that it didn't quite work, that we were, we were having to make a lot of assumptions ourselves, use our experience of working on runways rather than wait for the design to be finished. So we, we made it harder for ourselves by pushing too hard at the start. So that's one thing I've learned and I'll do differently. Anything for you, Andy? No, no, I'm good. I'm just good with it. All right. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Andy. And I think also mention thank you to Dan, who is in the background and wasn't actually able to join us in voice, um, in live voice, but contributed to the presentation as well. So I say thank you for the insight you've given us into the challenges of major infrastructure work and also the ways in which you can apply new technology to give a real benefit in delivering projects. Certainly, I think the stuff, if we can get the video running again, um, about, about the, the real time updates made it it's not it's not just tinkering or fancy stuff around the edges it, it's really effective um not technology for its own sake um thank you also to our audience we've had some really good we've had a lot of really good questions and also to the production team who've been busy behind the scenes particularly busy this time round. it was an ambitious setup so well, well done to the production team for 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 do, recovering it when it went slightly wrong um, you will, for the audience, you'll be able to watch this talk again. There might be a delay of a few hours, but you should be able to access this again using the same link and details used to join join this event. Um, we'll also publish a potentially slightly tidied copy on the Society's YouTube channel. That will probably take a week or two to come through. Um, our next event is on the 10th of May. Um, that's when Chris Burks, Emma Henderson and Colin McGregor of the Fresson Trust will tell us the story of Captain Ted Fresson and his exploits as a pioneer, pioneer of aviation. Um, good, start, good stuff, um, proper 30s discovering what you can, 1930s discovering what you can do, um, including establishing the first air link from the mainland to the islands. Um, and I think part of they might talk about things like pacing out the runway, the Kirkwall, I think it's Kirkwall um, airfield he paced out more or less on the links that were there originally. Um, so it's a really, really nice local connection as well and doing very, very, well, very, very new things with some fairly old fashioned, well, well, state of the art then, but not quite the, the high tech stuff we were used to now. Um, if you'd like to stay informed about Highland Branch activities, and if you want slightly more two way communication than you get from the newsletter, um, please join our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. Um, you'll find links for these in the Q&A tab shortly if they're not there already. Um, if you hang on, hopefully Dave will be able to show you the show you the video again. Um, and I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to Highland Branch events in the future. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs>